an honor to be here because I feel like I'm speaking to people who knew what the Second World War was. <laughs> and normally when I speak to my students, they don't even know who Jimmy Carter is. <laughs> Seriously. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. As I said, I, I came as a kid from Greensboro to the then School of Design in 1959. And it was, it was just sort of earth shaking for somebody who grew up in the suburbs to come to the School of Design where there were all these exotic faculty like Joe Cox and George Berline floating around. I mean, I, I felt like I was looking at unicorns. These people were so extraordinary. And so, you know, the first year just went by in a haze. But the second year, we got a little more comfortable with what was going on. And as students do, we would talk about who the good family were and you know, whose lectures were worth hearing. And a lot of us architects, we, we talked about this English below. We, we lectured on landscape at Lewis something or other. And of course, it was Lewis Clark. And I went to his lectures, and they were life changing because he described the landscape in such a way that it made sense to me as an architect. Now, of course, we weren't supposed to come to your lecture because we were architects and he was landscape architects. And I remember in particular, Lewis describing Castle Howard and the way that you approach this English country house, you know, up a winding road, which then turned into a straight road, but went up and down like this as it went over the hills and you arrived at Castle Howard. Well, you know, two years later, I moved to England to study, and where was the first place I went? Castle Howard. <laughs> Which is another way of saying that the sort of um, buildings I've always been interested in are the ones that started with the landscape. I'll have to say also, by way of explanation, that I come by this honestly because I'm married to a landscape architect, my wife, Judy Harmon, who's over there. But I have the greatest admiration. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Lewis. Thank you, Frank. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And I feel as though I've come home for a strange reason. Since I got to school in 1952 and uh, left in 68, and went back occasionally. So to be amongst a group of faculty again, I feel pretty comfortable. This course that, that uh, Frank describes was one of those kind of very unusual things that happen uh, in, in teaching. I was asked to put together uh, just a course that would work for anybody who wanted to come in. And uh, so we tried to do this. And really what it did, it just took various examples around the world and uh, asked the usual question, why? why is it what it is? So that if it's possible to ask why and what it is, then the students have to start. It's about a microphone that is open up this And so we had a shot at this, and uh, it, it uh, pulled people from everywhere, not only architects and landscape architects. It was a job, and the, I think it was really good. What you told me used to have it in, uh, and we, people would sit on the floor and say, that became very popular. And even uh, right now, there's a, a, a professor in, in the University of Edinburgh, just retired, Bill Brockton. Yeah. Bill Brockton. He uh, was so fascinated by the course that he now teaches the same course in Edinburgh. So, uh, so there are lots of things that happened with that. I, I got an email recently from uh, Fred Stresser in Florida, who said it's cost him close to half a million dollars to have taken that course. <laughs> <laughs> Since he and his wife have been back 40 times to uh, look at the examples in Europe uh, and, in the, and in the Far East. <laughs> so that, that, I think, answers that question. Um, I would like to ask you a question, Frank. Um, the, the School of Design uh, 
as far as I can see, really started about 1952. The 48 to 52 was a transition period in which it was really not accepted in the area at all. And the fact that it existed is unusual. It was in the South. Uh, nobody spoke the Southern accent. Everybody came either from Argentina, uh, from the North, California, uh, Buisson from France, and so on. So it should not have existed. What a strange place to find a school of architecture. Um, and it got this heterogeneous faculty together, uh, which uh, was a, almost a family in camp that it was fantastic. And putting together this faculty, uh, the fort amongst itself and the faculty meetings would go on to two o'clock in the morning. Um, once, once a month. And, and I think the school really is very much like uh, wine, vintage years, so that by 1962, uh, everyone had gone. Max Moto had gone, Roy Gusso had gone, Catalano had gone, Caminos had gone, and we could go and name them, Fitzgibbon, um, and uh, the school then became something different. You left in 61, and I've often wondered why. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gave that lecture about Castle Howard, and I think I would say it. <laughs> well, there was a, um, a senior student at the uh, uh, School of Design named Duncan Hudson, and he had come here to do his last year at the School of Design because, you know, the School of Design was famous. So across the country for the quality of its modernist thought. So he had come to learn about that, and he had previously been at this obscure school called the AA in London. Well, you know, I thought the AA meant, you know, not all it's anonymous. <laughs> but it's actually the Architectural Association, and uh, Duncan described it so wonderfully that I, I just couldn't resist going there. So I pleaded with Henry Camp Hefner give me a year off to do a year of study abroad. And I did that and I came back seven years later. <laughs> <laughs> because I was so taken with the education there. I didn't leave because I was not satisfied with the school. I saw this window out there that in a sense you and another professor, John Shaw, had prepared me for because they opened up the window of architecture all over the world, not just in this country, but in Japan and India and Europe, and it made me long to travel. Uh, I, I later in life learned that I am not, my, my learning method is not through reading, uh, but it's through experience. You know, we, uh, my understanding is that there's seven, seven different ways of learning, and the one that I do the best at is through experience. So. It was like, you know, taking scales off my eyes to travel in places like Europe. And I would, I would say to this day, that's the best part of my education, was travel. <laughs> now, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, one of the most amazing series of lectures you gave us were views of America from the air, <laughs> if you recall. And I want you to tell us how that came about. Really a complicated question because uh, <clears throat> trying to get students to understand the language. Uh, growing up in England, you can almost walk from a limestone to a sandstone to an igneous landscape. And each of these landscapes climax so that on a limestone it's going to be a very rolling countryside uh, the water will penetrate it and form caves underneath. Uh, it will climax uh, in a particular type of vegetation. Uh, the beech tree is typical of it. And uh, what I'm speaking about is called over here old field succession. If a farmer leaves his field, the weeds grow and then more plants grow. These are pioneers that nurture the plants underneath them then he finally finishes, for instance, in the sand areas, he would finish in a, uh, a, a pine, a, a lumbe pine. On the clays, it would finish in, say, oak, hickory. 
Um, so the thing, if you've got 30 inches of, of rainfall, you're going to get a forest cover. So in England, you can walk through probably five or six different of these kind of landscapes very quickly. Over here, of course, they're much more broadly spread. So what we were trying to do with them, with the air photos, was to describe the climax and why it happened. Um, the, the world is formed by erosion. A whole, the whole situation that we see is weathering and erosion. Uh, which of course the landscape architects deal with now is a big problem. Well anyway, in 1955 I started taking flight lessons. I said, this is ridiculous. I was trying to work with Gulio Dell in Charlotte. It take me four and a half hours to download drive to Charlotte. <laughs> and then, then consult for four or five hours, get back, it would be uh, you know, one o'clock in the morning, I'd have a class got an awful time at 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, so I said, this is ridiculous. <laughs> if I've got, to, I've got to, some work on the coast, that means I've got to fly to Charlotte. Good old Piedmont, you know, I loved old Charlie Davis and the uh, Piedmont Airlines. Change, that meant you might wait half a day in Charlotte. And then if you're going to Hilton Head, you have to uh, go to Charleston or Savannah, then get a car, so it'd take a day to get anywhere. And so I said, this is ridiculous, I'm going to learn to fly. So um, I did, and uh, Taylor Cobb and, and uh, uh, Myrtle Thompson, I learned to fly in a little tiny strip down in Smithfield. So anyway, I never looked back after that. Then I headed to the West Coast, of course, the next, next year, and bought a session of a tail dragger and uh, a minimum radio and none of the equipment. Anyway, my wife and I took the thing. <laughs> and we landed at Los Angeles in the smog and went up to Bob Royston and Ekbo and all the, the famous people and came back. So that's when I started taking pictures. And that's how uh, I started to influence the school. In fact, some of the faculty used to go out after classes on, in the afternoons. And Matsumoto loved to go and turn around. So, we, many, many of the faculty, and uh, Catalano used to, uh, was the mm. So that's the answer to that question. <laughs> Why don't we open up questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Well, Frank, since you mentioned Eduardo Catalano, you know, back in the 90s, there was, uh, uh, well, part of Malaga, apparently, uh, secured a donation from to erect uh, something on the court of North Carolina that raised, uh, created uh, quite a furor in your field. Uh, the professor, of uh, my respect, uh, was in the Department of uh, Horticulture that uh, actually got his students in class to write letters to, I think, to the chancellor and others that that should not be built on that sacred ground. What are your views, pro and con, if you can give an objective opinion uh, about that? You may have actually had uh, Professor Catalan make some teachers. I don't know what you thought was going to No, I didn't have uh, Eduardo Catalan as a professor. He was one of those uh, legendary dogs that walked around the school uh, who only taught the most senior students. So we never, I never had a class from him because I left. But Lewis did know him, and um, in brief, it was very controversial building this building. For myself, I think it was probably a bad idea. Um, the, the building had an inherent structural problem that was not going to be resolved, even if it had been built again. And once you saw the nature of the, the way that people cherish the court of North Carolina, uh, the thought of putting a building there just wouldn't work. But on the other hand, I will say that the original house that we're talking about, Eduardo Camelano's house, which is out off of Ridge Road, it's not there anymore. When I came here, I, when I came here in 1959, uh, a group of upperclassmen took us young freshmen on a tour of buildings, and when I saw that building, it took my breath away. It was extraordinary. 
a beautiful house. Uh, some of you may remember it. It was one sweeping roof made of wood called a hyperbolic paraboloid. No partitions underneath that went to the ceiling. It felt like you were living in the outdoors. It was on a hillside. I thought, wow, this is architecture. I, I visited T.C. Howard and his wife several times when they were living in the Catalano house. And I do have to say that it was absolutely beautiful and almost totally unlivable. <laughs> you know, that's what my wife says about me. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to uh, receive a question like that because there are a number of things to state now. First of all, I was in the house many, many times. And of course, uh, we used to go over with the students and it was a magnificent structure. And the hyperabaloy is, uh, in fact, I have a model of the Catalano house that I pulled out of a trash can that the students have thrown away. And the tip of it is damaged but it's hanging on my studio wall now. Um, I had many meals in the house, was over there many times. Uh, and even my good friend, Ezra Meyer, who bought it, his kids played with my kids. So I'm very, very familiar with the house. Um, it was a dirt drive, no, no kind of arrival, no architectural solution to the house. It sat there on the plinth in the middle of the woodland, magnificent. A terrible house, absolutely terrible. <laughs> now, for instance, if you happen to have to use the bathroom, uh, the, there was no ceiling. And you uh, knew that as soon as you flushed, that it would be a welcome sign throughout the whole house. <laughs> <laughs> there is nowhere in that house that you can put a wall, because every place is a different height. If you put a wall in that house, you ruin the space. The space is magnificent because it's like placing a park bench, for instance, if, if you're going to place a park bench, or a better example is a restaurant. When you go into a restaurant, you sit on the tables around the edge. You don't go into the middle and sit because your back is exposed. The house was super to look out. This magnificent sweeping wing out into the landscape. Uh, I, w I won't comment on the construction because uh, Frank has done that. Okay, uh, I knew I knew Catalano very well, um, and then Bob Burns proposed a replica of the house. It wasn't the house itself. He was going to rebuild a replica of the house in the Court of the Carolinas. The Court of the Carolinas had been a big concern of mine for many many years because I was always on the building and grounds committee and uh, did a lot of bono work. Uh, for instance, one of the bono works is actually this, this project, the faculty club. I remember designing the driveway and noticed that some of the magnolias are missing now where they die and so on. So, uh, on the Building and Grounds Committee, we managed, to, those of you who were here in those days, remember the Quonset huts that lined it? Uh, we managed to get those away. Again, I have a big connection to the Quonset Huts because Jim Fitzgibbon used them for storage for the Bucky Fuller domes. <laughs> uh, so we got rid of the Quonset Huts. I went to England briefly, came back, and uh, Max Smith, the good old campus engineer, was about to pay for the whole space where the Quonset Huts were to put cars in it. Uh, and so again, I spent a lot of time, three or four times, stopping cars being parked <laughs> in the, I, I don't think we call it the Court of the Carolinas then, in, 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 uh, in front of uh, Daniels. Um, and then on the other end was Primrose and Pullen. And uh, I remember the night the Pullen burned down, Patrick Horsburgh gave a lecture he said to the students, go out and set the world on fire. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, then came the Catalano had given a million dollars to Burns to build the replica in the court of the Carolinas. And I said, no, my God, we're not going to do that. So I called Catalano. Um, but of course, we had difficulty uh, uh, 
speak him because that, when you get agitated, and I don't speak Argentine, we had difficulty <laughs> communicating <laughs> the problem. For the life of me, I could not see building any form of building, any form of building at all, or putting any form of parking in the court of the Carolinas. And now it's the last loan that's left on campus, I think. And I just hope that we have someone who still stands up for it. So I wrote a, an editorial in the News and Observer. I uh, <laughs> got a lot of criticism for that. And uh, uh, joined Will Hooker. And uh, I was delighted when they decided, uh, the, the people decided not to build that building. Um, I had one disappointment in it. If in the old days, and when you get old, because I'll be, you know, 85 next birthday, so I'm just a walking relic. <laughs> but I look back and I remember that uh, Camp Hefner would have been furious. He'd have been out there chanting and shouting and <laughs> screaming about this. No, you won't do that. And I remember when the press wanted to put a nose on the state capital for one of the things. He was absolutely furious about a temporary nose being put on the state capitol. Well, I found from, from the school no support. I was out there alone, and I thought if I just go out and uh, object to this, there will be some support from the school. Uh, there was none. So thank God for Will Hooker. All four doing the replica, if you like replica because it is a, a tremendous, significant, significantly important building and, and should have been kept. But that's not the place to do it. There were many, many other places on campus where it could have been done. And the point I kept making, move it, put it somewhere else. Uh, and the trouble was that where, if, you, if you're going to build a building like a hyperaboloid, the best site is relatively flat, where it was originally done. And on, on the side, there was a, a platform out. Where this was proposed, it had a had an eight-foot retaining wall in front of it. In order to, to get the eight-foot retaining wall, it also had to dig into the bank so you could level it out. We lost three trees of those magnificent trees. We had a drainage problem behind the thing. And, and it just went against all the fundamental principles of landscape architecture. I had no choice. I had to object to it. And, um, well, that's all gone now, and thank God the court, the Carolina exists with no building in it. You do know the definition of a university. It's a group of very contentious and argumentative people loosely held together by a common grievance over parking. <laughs> buildings and location. Years ago I had a student, a former student, who was uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives in Juneau, Alaska. And he called up because they were considering a new capital and he wanted it in central Alaska. And he wanted classical buildings. And my first thought was Rico Roman buildings wouldn't fit in Alaska. But how does an architect feel about that? The, style of architecture have something to do with region? Well, my own view is that <coughs> the look and shape and organization of architecture uh, has everything to do with this region. The most satisfactory buildings in any state in North Carolina are actually not buildings done by architects, but they're done by farmers. Anywhere you go, if you find a farmhouse that was built more than 50 years ago or a barn, you'll see a building that takes absolutely into account its environment, the slope of the land, where the breeze comes from, how to shade it in the summer from the sun. And we take these things for granted. They're almost invisible to us. And I think that's because they fit so beautifully into the landscape. And since moving back to North Carolina 30 years ago, it's been a large part of my uh, enjoyment as well as creation of architecture to look at what is already here and how things have adapted. Now, you know, I've also learned as an architect that there are many points of view. And for many people, uh, having classical buildings which are symmetrical, balanced on both sides, 
use the classical orders and deal with proportion to them that's architecture they have you know that fits their mindset their view of the world um, I grew up realizing I was different I loved things that were off balance and, and you know reached out and joined the landscape and as much as glass and steel as I could use I was going to use it so I, I come from a different you know background I, I, you know, in that respect Don't you start with the brick walks? <laughs> <laughs> Again, there's a story there. Um, we managed to get Broder Sushi from the Semper Brick and Tile and Eisenhower Brick to give through the Brick and Tile Association Brick. And then we managed to get Max Smith to get two or three crews who trained, who did nothing but lay down brick. What we couldn't do, and there was so much pro bono work we had to do that uh, you couldn't lay it out so they just followed where the students went on campus and laid the brick which was better than knee deep mud anyway <laughs> the second part of the question uh, is a little bit how I started that we only know uh, where we are because of, sur of the surroundings that we uh, have five senses we can see it we can we can taste it uh, hear it all the rest of it so the, the echoes of a place or the tactility of walking over a pavement the five senses tell us the, the, the space that we're in for instance if you if you go to an historical court you recognize it is it because of the aroma is it because of the echoes is it because of the color textile so the, the one major aspect of landscape architecture is to create place which then gets you into a three-dimensional aspect and we developed one of the first model boxes with a, uh, a, a turntable to put models in that you could look visually into it um, so I, I, I think if you couple the creation of space which the architect does, of course, inside the building. He artificially controls the climate inside the building. The landscape architect is controlled by the climate outside. But both the architect and the landscape architect must be superbly developed in the five senses. Uh, and and uh, we have here uh, Charlie Burkhead. I saw him, uh, one of my ex-students who is an expert on therapeutic gardens and he may wish to comment after me on it um, but the, 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 that's the first thing that happens how do you create a place then how does it function which of course then involves the legs and the movement and, and the cars and of course I'd like to couple this with the last question that Frank also answered. You can, with an average architect, take his building, if it's successful in his terms, and locate it anywhere in the world, and it will work. The mechanical will work, it, you can live in it. So that uh, there are many, many buildings that uh, have a, a commonality about it in the world. The difference that is portrayed there is what the landscape architect does in the creation of space the reaction of the human understanding of of that building but uh, and I'm going to hand it back to Frank now because he is an absolute expert in creating in effect an artificial atmosphere inside for satisfactory living and in the present building that he's doing, which is magnificent in my, in my book, that transition, as soon as uh, you go through the door, you're in the outside. And that's where the landscape architect and the, and the landscape meet. And I, I think he should mention a few things about this very magnificent building that he's in the point of completing this for. The building Lewis is referring to is the, uh, it's a headquarters for all the architects of North Carolina who belong to the American Institute of Architects. And I won it as a competition. 
um, all the architects in North Carolina were permitted to enter this competition for their headquarters. And you had to be from North Carolina. And there were 60 entries and we won. And we were just absolutely thrilled that night. <laughs> Because when I woke up the next morning, I realized that I was going to have 2,400 other architects as my client. And 16 of them were going to be on the building committee, you know, you have a building committee. And eight of them had entered the competition. <laughs> so it's been a, it's been a great uh, learning uh, experience and, uh, and of course an honor, but also a great responsibility. Uh, we won the competition, my firm won the competition because we paired with the landscape architect. And it's on a very uh, interesting site in downtown Raleigh. Couldn't pick a more visible site for a headquarters like this. At the junction of Wilmington Street and Peace Street, and it's an odd shaped piece of land that's shaped like a pork chop. And, and from the work, from the day we got the competition announcement, I said, we need to have a landscape architect working with us on this one, which we always do. And so I asked Greg Bleem, who's a very good landscape architect in Charlottesville, Virginia, to join us, and together we developed a scheme. And we won the scheme, we won, as the jury told us, because we had thought about the site first at the same time that we thought about the building. And I've always found that's the, the most satisfactory way to work. I was a kid. I didn't know anything, but I knew how to ask the right question. If you ask the wrong question, of course, the probability of a good answer is remote. Um, ecology uh, then uh, was, for me, coming from England, uh, four stakes a meter apart that were put in the ground. And then the ecologist uh, excavated all the way down and made horizontal layers in which you could study and tell you what had happened on that one meter of land. And that's all I knew about ecology. And I was in Brian Hack in, uh, Hackett's course in, in King's College, and he would set problems to us. And that's when I first saw the one meter. And I said, if we make this a mile or five miles and do horizontal studies, uh, maybe we can learn more about it and uh, so when I, I did that at Harvard and then I came down here and it developed the first overlay system of recording data by depths uh, his historical data archaeology data as well as the climax data and so on and so I, I knew very little about it but there was R. Cooper who was uh, the real uh, ideal for my students because he would answer any question we had he taught us everything we knew about this ecological world and in fact art helped me a great deal on the on the Hilton Head project uh, all the fundamental basis of ecology we tried to build into that um, and if you don't have a booklet I've got a booklet I'd love to give you uh, that's got some of your work on your name in the back of it that you may not be familiar with. Another man was uh, Dr. Knight, an entomologist, who was a great help to us in these things. So uh, in, in the same way that the, the architect can only operate now with a set of consultants, that, that uh, there are really two kinds of architects. One's an, a conceptual architect and the other one is a project project architect and uh, and then you have the structural the mechanical the the, the, uh, uh, the uh, acoustics and so on that all have to be worked into a final design and in landscape it's the same way it's much more complex and uh, you have to rely on people like art to keep you on the right track and uh, it, it's so broad now that the, the landscape architecture field is uh, some landscape architects concentrate purely simply just on erosion and do all the stuff for the erosion 
But I'm delighted to see Arthur Gay, he's wonderful memories, and I'm deeply indebted to him for everything he did in helping us win those way back machine. <laughs> you must be older than me now. <laughs> Tell them we live through the airplane flight. <laughs>